Hi, welcome back, and I am so sorry I can't be with you today. I am just not feeling great, and so we're going to have to do this lesson virtually. Um, but luckily for you, it is a pretty easy lesson. So we will do um, a mini lesson on the material and then there is a delta math assignment that will be due that will be your um, grade for the day okay um, however also for you um, reminder that there our test for unit 4a is on friday and it is really imperative that you start preparing now. Don't wait till the night before. There's too much stuff on this test to start the night before. Uh, to help encourage you to start preparing, I put together a test boost assignment in Delta Math. You can earn up to five points that will be added to that unit for a test um, based on completing this assignment within Delta Math. Um, so it is due 8 a.m. on Friday. So uh, go ahead and get started working on that. Uh, also, the interim questions uh, just became made available for us to view. So I'll be making those adjustments. If you happen to score higher on like the Unit 1A material than you did on the original Unit 1A test, I will replace that test score. I'll have those adjustments done by the end of the week. Maybe not by Friday, but by the end of the day on Friday. All right. Um, I will be back on Wednesday. Uh, so I will honor anybody who signed up for Tuesday tutoring. If you already signed up for Tuesday and want to come on Wednesday, come on. Um, but uh, Thursday is going to be a great day for you to be, be working on stuff for uh, the test on Friday. Make sure that you sign up at least 24 hours in advance and let me know what you want to work on. Um, I'll have a, a review activity for us on Thursday and I'll keep that out so that we can uh, work further on that after school if that's what you want to do. All right, also, we are, uh, you know, coming down to the end. Uh, make every day count. And that's all on that. Uh, today, we're going to be learning about finding your average rate of change, especially in a quadratic function. You can use this idea for any function. Um, so, it's very versatile, but... Uh, it is something that we haven't done quite like this before. It's going to seem familiar because there is something very much like it that we did when we talked about linear functions. So let's jump on in. All right. So first let's talk about a linear function. All right. Uh, on the left here, we have a linear function. And on the right, we have a quadratic function, right? A parabola. If we're going to focus our attention, though, for a second on the linear function, if I were to choose uh, a couple of points, um, let's, let's choose these two points. And I wanted to know the rate of change between these two points. I would be really looking for the slope. So up one and right two, my slope would be one half. Uh, and if I chose these two points here, let's actually change color here so we can differentiate. Um, these two points here, if I look, I went up two and right four, this is going to be slope is equal to two over four, which is the same as one half. Uh, and let's do something really outlandish and let's go from, uh, this point to this point. So this would be, let's see, up one, two, three, four, up six. And right, oh my gosh, uh, over 12. So if I'm looking at that, my slope is going to be 6 over 12, which is also 1 half. 
It does not matter which two points I choose on a linear function, my rate of change is always going to reduce to 1 over 2. However, that's not true when I'm talking about a quadratic function. Let's pick a couple of points and then just look at what's going on. Um, we could pick maybe uh, the y-intercept and this point. In this case, we have a pretty steep rate of change between these two points. Um, but what if I chose these two points? Oh, we've got a, a kind of shallow negative rate of change. What if I chose um, these two points right here and here? Oh, there's actually no change between these two points. Or what if I chose these two points here and here. If I chose these two points, it's going to be very steep. Yep. Very steep negative rate of change. With a quadratic function, the interval that we're checking that rate of change in matters, and it's going to be different. And so we need to learn how to handle that. So whereas a linear function is going to have always the same rate of change, in other words, it's called a constant rate of change because it doesn't change. The rate of change doesn't change. That's kind of funny. Um, with a quadratic function, it really depends on which two x values you begin with. All right, so... Let's look at how would we find the average rate of change of a quadratic function. Find this page in your notes. I think it's like page 30-ish or something along those lines. I'm not quite positive. Maybe 36? Maybe 36. Not quite sure. All right. So an average rate of change. This really describes how fast a function changes over a specific amount of time over a specific interval. So how fast the function changes over a specific interval. Okay, so how do we find the average rate of change? Well, if I choose two points or two x values as a and b, I am going to put these values in this um, equation or this formula. Uh, a and B are going to be on the bottom. I'm going to take the difference between them. Remember, these are X values. So on the bottom here, I have the change in the X values. And then if I find out what the corresponding Y values are, I can put those up here in the top. Now, you might say to yourself, this looks kind of familiar. And in fact, it really is pretty familiar. Because if we think about it, if I'm taking a change in x values, that would be the same as like x2 minus x1. And then the corresponding y values would be y2 minus y1. And really what we're doing when we're finding the average rate of change is we are finding the slope of the line that goes through those two points. So going back to this idea, if I wanted to find the average rate of change between like x is equal to zero and x is equal to, uh, let's see, 45. What I'm really finding is the slope of the line that goes through those two points. Okay. Now notice that's not the graph. It's not the graph at all. But I'm finding the average amount of change in the y's versus the x's for those two values. So let's go back and let's walk through a couple of examples. A company manufactures and sells a certain product. The company's revenue from selling X products or X units of product is given by the quadratic function shown. So we are seeing the function as both the graph of the function 
and a table with some uh, values that are within the function as well. Okay. So we are going to be asked to find the average rate of change between 10 and 30 units. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I'm, we're gonna look at uh, it graphically and with a table. If I am finding the average rate of change between, um, oh, and we'll look at it like this, it'll be like between 10 and 30 units. We can look at it like this or where X is between 10 and 30, or just um, verbally between 10 and 30. We're gonna locate the X value where it's X equals 10, and, and that would be right here and on the graph, right? And where X is equal to 30 is going to be right here. So now what we're really interested in is what is the slope of the line that goes through those two points. Well, handy dandy, we can just go up and right, up 400 and right 20. And we can say, okay, well, the slope, the average rate of change, which is a rock average rate of change is gonna be the difference in the Y values or 400 divided by the uh, um, difference in the x values, which is 20. And so here our average rate of change is gonna be 20. And we'll talk about how to interpret that in a second. Now, if we're looking at the table, same idea, we're going from 10 to 30, we want the y values that go with it. And then we can put those things into our uh, formula, or we can just look at the difference between the y's which is gonna be 400, right? Here's your 400. And the axis, which is gonna be 20. So 400 divided by 20 will also give us 20. All right, so finding uh, that average rate of change, here it is as starting with that formula, subbing the values into the formula, either from the table or the graph and then simplifying and then interpreting 20. And so now how do we say verbally what that really represents? The average rate of change, and we need to say between what values? Between 10 units sold and 30 units sold is an increase because it's positive, an increase of $20, and that is going to be our y-axis. Look, our Y value is dollars per unit sold. So this is our Y unit per our X unit. Okay, so when we are saying this um, verbally, we always wanna do plus or minus, increase or decrease, the value, and then say something about the units, the Y units per the X unit. All right, so let's try a couple of other examples. Now, uh, in this case, we don't have a context, we just have a graph. Oh, but we have a graph and we have a function. So we are, let's do it both ways. Um, it is easier to use the function, I'm sorry, the graph than the function, but you can do it either way. So if we're gonna look at the graph, if we're gonna use the graph, we are going to use, um, this is the two x values that we're interested in. So x2 is gonna be one, x1 is gonna be negative one. Now I need to find the y's that go with these. So let's find x equals one on the graph. And the y that goes with this is gonna be zero. So y2 is gonna equal zero. And then if I'm looking at x equals negative one, I'm just gonna come down here and find the y value that goes with that. Looks like there our y one is gonna be negative four. And so when I substitute these things into my formula, y two minus y one, zero minus negative, uh, actually let's go back. Let's put the formula up so that we've got that. 
y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. The y2 is 0 minus the negative 4 over x2, which is 1 minus the negative 1. Then we would you know, simplify this. 0 minus a negative 4. That's going to be 0 plus 4. So 4 over 1 plus 1, which is 2. And our average rate of change between negative 1 and positive 1 is 2. Okay, so how would we say this? We would say the average rate of change, we can abbreviate that, AROC, between negative 1 and 1. increases um, by two units every one unit. Okay, uh, two units, that's my y per every, uh, increases two units per every one unit. This is going to be my x unit. Okay, and if you are looking at that slope, that's exactly what that looks like. All right, now, if we're thinking about this from the equation standpoint, we get, we're going to start with the same x2 and x1 as we had before. We have 1 and negative 1, but if we're looking at the equation, we in order to get the y's, we're going to use our calculator or just substitute these values in. Okay, so if I want to substitute the 1 in, so I'm going to move these over a little bit. Okay, if, I, if I'm looking at x2, I would be 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 3. And that's going to be 1 plus 2, which is 3 minus 3, which is 0. And if I do the same thing for negative 1, this is going to be negative 1 squared and put a negative 1 there. So I'd have a positive 1 minus 2 minus 3, and we'd get negative 4. And notice they're the same things. We're just getting them from a different source. On the right, we got them from the graph. On the left, we got them from the equation. And you would use the same formula to find that average rate of change. All right, so let's look at what if you have a table, okay? What if you have a table? Well, it's the same idea, except it's super, super duper easy. All right, here are my x values, x2 and x1. So we can say x2 is going to be 3 x1 is going to be negative 5. Now we want to find the y values that go with these, and we're just going to find them from the table. Find an x value of 3, and you see that we have x value of 3 here. The y value that goes with it is negative 35. Now if I'm thinking about the y, or I'm sorry, x1, that's negative 5. And the y value that goes with it is negative 3. So now we can substitute this into my formula, x2 minus x1 over y2. Oh, I'm sorry. That's stupid. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So my y2 is going to be negative 35 minus negative 3 all over x2, which is 3, minus negative 5. All right. So negative 35 plus 3 is going to equal negative 32. Negative 3 plus 5 is going to be positive 8. And so we have a negative 4. So my average rate of change here decreases, let's see, we should say, 
uh, average rate of change between um, negative 5 and 3 decreases 4 units per unit. Okay, so the four units, this is going to be my y value, my y units, and this is going to be my x units. So for every four units on the y axis, um, or four units down, we go one unit over. All right, last one to do. Here we have just the function, just the equation. And we are finding our average rate of change between negative 8 and negative 3. So let's go ahead and say x2 is negative 3. x1 is going to be negative 8. Then let's find the y value that goes with negative 8. So f of negative 8 is going to be negative 8 squared plus 10 times negative 8 plus 21. So this is going to be our y value that goes with negative 8. So that's going to be 64 mi uh, minus 80 plus 21. And I think that gives us a y value of 5. So our y1, the y that goes with the negative 8, is going to be 5. Now what about if I find f of negative 3? f of negative 3, we're going to do the same thing, except this time we're going to substitute in our negative 3. Negative 3 squared plus 10 times negative 3 plus 21, and so this is going to be 9 minus 30 plus 21, and that's going to be 9 plus 21 is 30, minus 30 is going to be 0, so y2 is going to equal 0. So we're going to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Y2 is 5 minus 0 over negative 8 minus negative 3. That's a positive. We end up with 5 over negative 5, which is negative 1. So our average rate of change from uh, negative 8 to negative three decreases one unit per unit. So this is my y value or y unit and this is my x unit. So I'll go down one unit for every one unit I go over for on that interval. All right, that'll do it. So now what you're going to do is um, you're going to practice on delta. There is, I think, it's eight or ten problems on delta math to help you practice these. And after you're done with that, you can start the test boost and start preparing for that test on Friday. All right, y'all, I will see you as soon as I can, hopefully Wednesday. All right, take care. Bye-bye.